Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've got some graphics in this which are quite small, so if, if anyone has bad eyes or is like me and needs glasses, do feel free to sit near the screen because it's like quite precise. Uh, but anyway, hello, uh, my name's Charles. Uh, I'm here from the World Bank, uh, the World Bank's geospatial operations support team. Uh, this is a little unit that I helped to bring into existence in 2016, and since then, We've helped over 80 different of the World Bank's task teams uh, with their geospatial analysis in uh, 50 different countries. So today I want to talk to you about how, how OSM informs the analytics and operations uh, of the World Bank with reference to one particular case study. And that's the work that I did for the city of Tbilisi in Georgia, and here it is on the left. I want to note uh, before we get going that this is specifically the work uh, that I did that leveraged OSM. There are so many other really talented and creative and intelligent people at the World Bank who are using OSM for all sorts of stuff, uh, but I wouldn't be doing their work justice by skimming over it at light speed in this little presentation. So um, don't see this as everything that the World Bank is doing. This is just one little microcosm. Uh, but first, let me take a moment to reflect on why a development organization like the World Bank might be interested in the quality of a city's green spaces. Access to high quality green space is important for three main reasons, environmental, social, and economic. Uh, on the environmental side, studies have shown that green areas can reduce air particulate pollutant concentrations. They encourage really positive green behaviors like walking or cycling to work instead of taking the car. They have a cooling effect on the surrounding urban area, which is great in like very, very hot cities. And similarly, in very, very wet cities, they improve the drainage ability. So, you know, Hurricane Florence and all the flooding that we've been seeing recently, the more green spaces, the better. On the social side, uh, way back in 1984, uh, a guy called Ulrich did a study on surgery patients. And he found that the patients who had a view out of the window onto a green space had shorter post-operative hospital stays and took fewer painkillers than the people who had a view out onto a brick wall. More recently, and closer to home, uh, the Scottish government found in 2014 that uh, in deprived urban areas, people had a 16% lower chance of dying in any given year if they lived in an area with green space as opposed to the, the similar people who sort of lived in a more densely urban environment with fewer green spaces. The economic side is more of a hunch on my part, hence the question marks, it's hard to find data on this, but I reckon as the top tier of labor is becoming increasingly internationally mobile, uh, if you don't make your city pleasant to live in, people are going to leave. Uh, and what's more, this is going to be increasingly important over time. Back in 1990, around 40% of us were living in cities, but it, that's forecast to grow to 70% of us or thereabouts by 2050. What's more, the, the total worldwide rural population has already peaked and is on its way down. So making the urban experience a positive one is a structural as well as a social, economic, and environmental imperative. Back to Tbilisi. Now, Tbilisi is by no means an urban hellscape. In fact, parts of Tbilisi are really quite beautiful, as you can see. But it does suffer from three common ailments in post-Soviet cities. The first is infill of greenfield and brownfield spaces as the urban center densifies as property values near the center go up. The second is a central arterial construction around a major highway or motorway. And dense housing, as you can see in this picture. This is actually the same city. I stole this picture from Reddit's Urban Hell subreddit, uh, where Tbilisi made an ignominious appearance uh, three years ago. Earlier this year, the World Bank was in the early stages of discussions with the mayor's office about turning the situation around. This means introducing more green space into areas that are underserved, and also enriching the quality of existing green space, um, wherever it may be. In this context, the team asked us for help in answering two main questions. Who can currently get to a park? And what's the park like when you get there? So I'm going to break this presentation into, into two parts and address each question in turn. The first bit will be about how OSM supported our access analysis, and the second will be about how OSM was critical to the machine learning solution we put in place to appraise the quality of parks. Oh. So, uh, question one. Historically, people in development used distance buffers to approximate service catchment areas from points of service. A great example of this is the Rural Accessibility Index which defines rural accessibility as the percentage of the rural population that lives within two kilometers of an all-weather road. I'd argue that it's not really good enough to apply a distance buffer to green assets, which makes the assumption that all urban land is traversable. Urban objects and furniture like highways, water bodies, dense vegetation, gated communities, these all prevent straight line travel from being a good assumption. 
Then you've got the boundary issue. If you make your boundary 500 meters from a park, does someone 499 meters from the park have access and someone 501 meters from the park not? It just doesn't make any logical sense. So we could conclude that a good indicator ought to be continuous as opposed to discrete. And a good indicator ought not to be based on distance, which is a poor assumption in urban environments. I'm not usually a sign guy, uh, but if I was, I'd probably hold one like this. Uh, I'm really passionate about making sure that wherever possible, uh, I apply these principles in measuring accessibility for any service uh, in the work that I do for the bank, be it hospitals, banks, markets, whatever it might be. Happily, uh, there is a practical alternative to distance buffers, and that's travel times. This is both a continuous value from any given starting point, and it really reflects how people think about the trips they take in their everyday lives. We collectively measure the trips that we take by the time they take, not by the distance we travel. So we want to measure people's accessibility to parks on this basis. But how do we do that for an entire population going to any number of parks? Well, we break it down and we do it one origin to one destination at a time. And then we repeat. But what should our origins be here and what should our destinations be? Luckily, Tbilisi's government knows which land areas are residential, which makes for a good enough approximation for where people are starting their trips from. We overlaid a grid on it. Uh, every grid square is 50 meters by 50 meters, so pretty high resolution. And then we took the center point of each of these grid squares to generate some random origin points. Then for the destinations, we took the data in OpenStreetMap for Tbilisi, and we improved it through a series of mapathons. We held an initial data entry mapathon in Washington, and then we validated that with the local OSM community with a second mapathon in Tbilisi. They either rejected or accepted the changes we made to their parks. We mainly sought to rectify the issues of sort of poorly mapped parks or misuse of the parks tag and spotting and adding additional park as assets to the map. You might think that spotting a park from satellite imagery is easy, but I've designed a game to prove to you how fiendishly difficult this can be. I'm going to show you two satellite uh, images over candidate parks, right? And only one of these two images is going to be a park. And I want you to put your hand up at the end if you think it's a park. We clear? OK, off we go. This is candidate image number one. And this is candidate image number two. Wait, 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 wait. All right, hands up if you thought image number one, the one with the large water body, was the park. OK, and how, how many for number two? All right, so the vast majority for number two. Well, this is candidate image number one, seen in various different lights at ground level. It's called Lisi Lake, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's got nice broad walks by the side of the lake. It's got some cafes, some restaurants. It's a really very pleasant place to spend a Sunday afternoon. This is candidate image number two at ground level. We asked one of our consultants to go and take some photos of this asset for us in the field because we were so sure it looked like a park from the satellite imagery. It turns out it's some sort of abandoned healthcare facility, and most of the images speak for themselves. It looks like there were some once some landscape paths, but they've fallen into total disrepair. There's also some fairly creepy abandoned looking buildings around. Uh, this is not really a park or a green space that you'd want to spend family time in um, on, a, on, a, on a weekend. So after generating the origin and destination points uh, from the residential layer and the OSM, we turned to OSRM, or the Open Source Routing Machine for the hard part. OSRM, at its most basic, is an API service that serves up the travel time between origins and destination points. It does this by assuming a speed for road users on each type of highway tag, and then uses Dijkstra algorithms to back solve the most efficient way of getting from A to B. It also builds in the impedances of objects, uh, e.g. preventing pedestrians from just strolling across highways and preventing Jesus-esque travel across bodies of water. OSRM is pretty advanced. Uh, people are often surprised that it serves up a different travel time when you're going from B to A as opposed to A to B. And that's because it factors in a lot of the non-linearities in journeys. For example, the increased time taken to turn left, uh, all one-way streets and so forth. The free service that's hosted by Mapbox, I think, uh, allows you to do 25 origins to 25 destinations at a time, which is pretty good. Uh, but we needed to scale up massively for this project. So we installed uh, our own version of OSRM on a computing cluster, which allowed us to go up to 100 origins to 100 destinations at a time for a total of 10,000 journeys per second. And that averages out at about 36 million travel times that we can calculate per hour against the OpenStreetMap network. 
So now we can do loads and loads of travel times, uh, thanks to OSM and OSRM. These are two main, but how do we translate that into accessibility specifically? Well, there's two main ways that I know of doing this. The first is the only the closest destination matters approach. This is a really good model for stuff like emergency services, like hospitals. Uh, or if you're running out of gas, where's the nearest petrol station? It's a good model for if you're buying a house, which is the nearest metro station or the nearest grocery store. But it might also be a good model for the smaller local parks. If you've got a dog and you need to walk him every day, then you probably don't care about the time taken to get to all the parks in the city, just your closest local park. This is what our OSRM-powered approach generated for Tbilisi using the isochron method. The yellow colors are the shorter travel times and the purples are the longer travel times. As you can see, most of the central neighborhoods have great coverage, with relatively poor coverage in the northern and peripheral neighborhoods. This particular image is showing walking accessibility. It also shows just how good OSRM is. I want to highlight Lisi Lake on the middle left. You can see that nearby neighborhoods don't have particularly good accessibility to the lake uh, because it's on an elevated plateau, which is harder to reach on foot, and OSRM bakes that into the calculations, which I think is pretty neat. The other way of doing accessibility is weighted accessibility. This is when you don't just care about one destination in the destination set, but you care about your travel time to all of the destinations in the destination set. This is better for gauging accessibility for businesses to markets, right? If you're a business, you want to put yourself where you're going to maximize your market potential or by being near as, to as many people, cities, or markets as possible. Similarly, for the modern millennial, it's not good enough to be just near to one coffee shop or one avocado on toast vendor. <laughs> You want to maximize your accessibility to all, of the, all the destinations in the destination set. It might also be a good model for big destination parks as well. If you're looking to spend an entire day at the park with a picnic, you're not going to just use the same park over and over again. You're going to want to move around over the space of a couple of years. Applied to Tbilisi, this is what we get. The highest levels of weighted accessibility are in the urban core, where most of the big organized parks are. Due to the size of Kudadov Forest on the right and the ease with which people can get there, uh, accessibility is highest on its boundary. Once again, Lisi Lake, from our example earlier, doesn't have the same gravitational effect as Kudadov Forest, despite being similar in size, because it's harder to get to by car. We've repeated this analysis for various different recreational assets in Tbilisi. Pitches, playgrounds, parks, you name it. We split off the top 30 parks by size into an additional separate asset class, which we call the destination parks. These are the must-see or most visited parks in Tbilisi. This is what we found. These are the headlines. An accessibility corridor exists along the main road for the top 30 parks. If you're near the motorway, your accessibility is going to be pretty good. Secondly, black spots for driving access to the top 30 are actually consistent with black spots uh, for the walking access to the local parks. If you're not served by the main corridor, you aren't served by substitute smaller local parks in your local neighborhood. You just don't have access to a park, period. Accessibility to sport pitches is universally pretty good. There's over 500 in Tbilisi. Uh, but accessibility to playgrounds for small children is less so. Although we suspect this might be a data issue in OSM because playgrounds are more infrequently mapped. And finally, a few of these major parks are serving the majority of the hotels. I don't have time to go through all of the maps that support this. You'll just have to take my word for it. But we can go even further than this uh, and allow us to make direct policy prescriptions and recommendations from this technology. For this next analysis, the origins I used were the currently underserved, the people in Tbilisi in the bottom 20% by current access to a park. For the destinations, I defined a range of sites from OpenStreetMap, which could be considered by the government for upgrading into proper parks. These were polygons tagged as stuff like brownfield, as recreation ground, and so forth. We made sure these potential upgrade assets were high quality by dropping all of the super skinny ones. We dropped anything under a hectare in size, and we dropped anything that was within, within 200 meters of an existingly mapped school so as not to double count any existing recreational assets. These became the destinations in a new accessibility analysis. And this is what that looks like. So this is a pretty difficult map to interpret, so I'm going to just walk you guys through it. The green is the current park assets. The purple blobs are the people who are the currently worst served in the community. The yellow ones are all the sites we considered for potential upgrade. And the blue ones are the top 20 that maximize the potential improvement in terms of travel time to a park. Now, there's a lot wrong with this approach, uh, but it's a great starting point for future investigation and in-person site evaluation. Uh, 
as a satellite imagery example just showed, you can't do all of this, uh, this kind of geospatial mapping without any local context, right? But it is a good place to start from. Happily, Tbilisi's latest master plan includes proposals for four new parks, including two new parks on spots that were identified on the previous slide in those blue areas. Um, but it, it's great to see that this kind of analysis is consistent with the way that the government is thinking about where they want to put their new parks. So on to question two. I'll keep this much briefer than part one, uh, if only because I'm less responsible for it, but it's no less interesting. We worked with Global Green City Watch to deploy their code base for our project in Tbilisi. As their website splash says, Global Green City Watch won Digital Globe's GBDX for Sustainability Challenge. This competition made available Digital Globe imagery uh, for teams to develop products specifically focusing on the topic of sustainability. And these guys won it. I thought their platform and code was so innovative and replicable that I reached out to them and invited them to start working with me on this Tbilisi project. Uh, in particular, I want to pause and thank uh, Chris Van Diamond, Nadine Gal, and Jim Groot, who've all been incredibly helpful in making this deployable within the World Bank, and also for helping me to explain the value of their work on their behalf. Now, the Global Green City Watch COSAC does a lot of stuff, but in brief, it tries to grade parks on a one to five scale on a range of indicators that can be bucketed into two brackets, ecological and social. The indicators selected are those that say the most about the park, but are also easy to measure from space. Some of these are calculated straight from the image or the open street map themselves, whilst others require the training and deployment of a machine learning classifier to interpret the land cover types of the park. They built and trained such a model from the polygons in OpenStreetMap. One thing that I found super interesting about their methodology was that the team made extensive use of signals beyond the human visual range. As you can see, the spectrum of light that is visible to humans is actually pretty narrow. It's between 400 and 700 nanometers. But the Digital Globe Worldview 2 and Worldview 3 satellites are actually taking in a lot more than that. These are the various different bands of the Worldview 2 sensor. As you can see, the red edge and the infrared signals are beyond the visual human range to humans. This is super fantastically useful because it allows the machine learning classifier to look at a park in a way that we can't and to infer signal from it. Uh, for example, water uh, has a very, very distinct spectral signature in the infrared band. We can use this extra information to pick out things in the image that we care about. This is the NDVI classification, which picks out the trees and grass in one image over Tbilisi. We compared polygons tagged in OSM as forest, grass, building, and water to the corresponding digital globe satellite imagery over those assets. In this way, we trained a model to classify into four classes, grass, trees, impermeable, and water, every pixel in a candidate image. One point to note is that it was important to be incredibly discriminating in this training process. Uh, I picked out this stadium on the left because it was tagged as a normal building in OpenStreetMap, but we wouldn't want to associate the NDVI values of the grass in the middle of the stadium with the building class, which would mess up the ability of the machine learning classifier to infer a signal. Uh, we'd actually want to build our building class much more of buildings like that on the right, which is just solid all the way through. Similarly, this picture of a forest would have to be chucked out because it's got a building in it, and this mask of a water area would have to be chucked out because it's got an island in it which isn't cut out. I think I ended up going through 50 candidate images for every single class and only choosing three or four examples for each. But I could afford to do that because the information density in these satellite images is so dense. Now onto the machine learning results. Looking at the eight bands of the sensor, plus five synthetic bands that we calculated, NDVI, an iron index, two building indices, and a water index, the machine learning model created this mask for water, and it created this one for buildings, and it did this one for grass and trees. We then applied this to just the parks in Tbilisi. This is Reich Park on the right in downtown Tbilisi. On the right-hand image, red is any impermeable surface, orange is water, blue is grass, and green is trees. As you can see, the classifier has done a fantastic job of splitting out the paths from the grass. It also does a fairly good job of demarking the water bodies. The leftmost edge of the park is actually water because it fronts onto the river Veer, and there's a fountain that's picked out pretty well in the middle of the image as well. We can tell a lot from this. For example, it becomes immediately obvious that a lot of this park is paved. Moving to the Hippodrome, here you can see again that the algorithm has done a fantastic job of differentiating between impermeable surfaces, such as the building in the bottom left and the road around the Hippodrome. But 
it, what's incredibly clever is that it doesn't register the paths in the middle of the hippodrome as paths at all, uh, as impermeable surfaces, sorry. This is because these are dirt paths, and that's largely the beyond the human visual range stuff coming into play again. There are a couple of places where this classifier is still weak. Uh, for example, it hasn't fully appreciated the difference between grass and trees, and we're getting some false positives for water. But on the whole, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can live with it. Uh, so in terms of policy recommendations, we plotted out the NDVI for the top 30 parks and found a relatively wide disparity in the greenness of parks in Tbilisi, with some clear candidates for additional greening, like Reich Park that I just showed you. One of the other indicators we plotted out was social amenity score. This is the degree to which the park has facilities which people will find useful, like benches and restrooms, playgrounds, pitches, that sort of thing. We found very few parks in Tbilisi had an excellent score on this. Uh, with big ones like Kudadov Forest in the middle there with basically zero social amenities. So this is a clear recommendation to the government in how they can improve the, uh, the quality of the park experience for their people. Finally, we looked at the stormwater capture potential of, the, of each park, or the ratio of grey to green surfaces. Most parks scored very highly, especially around the edge, but generally speaking, those in the centre had lower drainage scores. This suggests that if the city is worried about flooding, they ought to consider uh, doing some additional greening on those parks. All right, uh, that's the end. Thank you very much uh, for paying attention. And I'd like to just do five quick thank yous. Uh, thank you to the OSM community, uh, without whom this analysis would definitely not have been possible. Thank you for Mapbox uh, for continuing to support the OSRM project. Thank you to Global Green City Watch and their creativity, enthusiasm, and professionalism in working, with this, uh, working on this project with me. Thanks to Teach OSM and Stephen Johnson for trusting me with admin privileges on the, the Teach OSM tasking manager. And thanks to Digital Globe for throwing, uh, throwing up the GBDX for Sustainability Challenge. I uh, welcome any questions you might have. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Right, so uh, the Global Green City Watch code stack is available on GitHub, and they do have a website as well. If you, if you Google Global Green City Watch, you should probably be able to find it. The OSRM stuff is not published, uh, but OSRM is a free public service. So the co you could write your own code to do it, or I could share it with you afterwards if you're interested in getting mine. In terms of in a public forum, this, this was... A pun? Oh, sorry, the question was, is this analysis publicly published? Uh, and the answer to that in, in that specific context is no. This was shared with the Tbilisi government. Um, we haven't put it up on a website or, or something like that. I, I imagine if they continue forward and they actually build the parks in their master plan, we might well do something. But. Yes? Right, so I went through about 250, but I kept about 15. Uh, and that was because so many of the OSM polygons if it was a forest, they included something like a building or the edge of a road or whatever. And I was looking for almost completely homogenous examples, right? Where it was a polygon over water, it needed to be 100% water under that, under that edge. Uh, I could have done a bunch of stuff, like done a negative bu buffer on the polygon to bring it in a little bit to avoid some of this. Uh, but it's also true that Tbilisi's OSM isn't the most complete out there, right? So I had fewer examples to work with and fewer well-mapped examples. And we didn't really have time to go through everything and, and change the exact geometry of all of the land cover types. So we kind of had to work with what we had. Right, so we, uh, yeah, we corrected all of the park assets through various different mapathons, not only in DC, but with Tbilisi as well, and there are a bunch of assets. I pretty much did it myself as I was going along. Like I'd run the analysis, and then I would spot that polygon was off, and whilst it was cooking, I'd basically log on to OpenStreetMap in Jossum and, and just mess around with the edges. So uh, there was a personal effort, but not a very structured effort. Any others? Hey. Right. Sure, um, so that's very common. As, as I said, there's like a, lo a lot of different things that go into the selection of a site, right? In, including ownership, what are the surrounding structures. Um, I was looking at this from a maximizing accessibility for the local population view, but that's not consistent with uh, government's political aims in, in many cases. They often, often they will have made a decision about where they're gonna put the park before they see the analysis. That's very common as well. Um, 
I looked at it as reassuring that, that two spots were uh, in the areas that I identified which would most maximize accessibility. But there's definitely not a one-to-one -one correlation with we've done this research and now you should therefore follow through on it. You, you have found the proverbial Achilles heel in my presentation. Uh, there was no consideration of multimodal. Uh, however, I throw that open to the community as I would love to see an easy version of o like an OSRM style API that will serve up uh, walking, multimodal and driving at the same time. I looked at travel on foot and I looked at travel by car separately, but I don't think there was like a GTFS style uh, transport system for to PC that I could use that was baked into an a API. Uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to design that, I would love to use it and shout about your work. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, thank you very much.